Thank you everybody for coming tonight. We're going to get started, so if we could um, um, get to the room. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Human Rights Human Right to Healthy Awards. Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome all of you. My name is Dwight Fedick, and I'm a proud board member of the National Homelessness Law Center and a co-chair of tonight's event. At the Law Center, housing is a human right, and we have renamed this nonpartisan awards event to emphasize this critically important commitment. This year, also for the first time, we're holding these awards together with the National Right to Housing Forum, which as many of you know is the Law Center's conference on legal and policy approaches to ending homelessness. As the legal arm of the national movement to end homelessness, tonight we honor five key leaders in the fight to end and prevent homelessness. First, we'll have Congresswoman Cori Bush from the state of Missouri and a champion of ending homelessness. We have a Bigger Vision Films, the acclaimed documentary film company. The law firm of Alston and Bird for their outstanding pro bono contributions. And three new awards this year. A state legislator award going to Nicole Macri of Washington State. A local legislator award going to Mike Bonin of Los Angeles and a justice award honoring leadership in the legal movement to end homelessness going to Patricia Mulehi Fougere for her leadership of the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. You will hear many inspiring words and voices tonight, all supporting justice for unhoused people. If there is a word or a voice that inspires you tonight, please show your support by texting HRTH for housing, um, for HRTH 22 to 44321. That's HRTH 22 to 44321. Or simply use the QR code on the cards that are on the tables around the room. Your generosity will help the Law Center continue to lead the legal charge to end homelessness. We are so thrilled to be joined by all of you and to be in person again for the first time since 2019. So thank you all so much. We want to acknowledge the sponsors, uh, primary sponsors of tonight's event, many names that you have seen here on the boards, um, but especially our Leaders of Justice sponsors, Kaiser Permanente and the National Association of Realtors. And a very special thank you to Ake and Gump, our kind and gracious hosts for both the Housing Forum and the awards event and making this wonderful space available to all of us this evening. We are also, yes, this is a round of applause. We are also pleased to recognize some sponsors who joined us in the past week, including the law firms of Jones Day, Freed Frank, McCarter English, Deckard and Mintz. Thanks to all of you for being a part of the movement to end homelessness. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my fellow board member, Kirsten johnson Obi, who will introduce our first award winner. Kirsten. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's so great, as Rex said, to be here in person and see familiar faces and new faces. Uh, as Dwight said, my name is Kirsten johnson Obi. I am a longtime board member of the Law Center. I can't remember how long, so not, we're not going to play that game. But um, back in the day, I worked for Congressman Bruce Bento, and I worked for him for almost 15 years as his housing staffer and then as his banking committee staffer. And Bruce was passionate about public service and making a difference in the everyday lives of people, whether it was preserving parks, and those of you who know him know he did that a lot, for future generations or preventing and ending homelessness. It is with that passion in mind that I say it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Bruce F. Bento Award tonight. We are honored to present this year's Bento Award to Congressman Cory, Congresswoman, excuse me, Cory Bush. 
Corey Bush is a registered nurse, a community activist, organizer, single mother, and ordained pastor, representing the people of Missouri's first congressional district. Congressman Bush, through, though in her first term of the U.S. House, has had extraordinary impact. She served on the House Judiciary Committee, including as the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, and also the House Oversight Committee. But some of you will know her best for her honesty about her own experience as homelessness and her well-publicized and successful public protest to extend the nationwide eviction moratorium in 2021, which seems like about 100 years ago, but it was only last year, in 2021, by camping out on the steps of the U.S. Capitol for five days under banners firmly stating housing is a human right. Center has been honored to work with Representative Bush and her incredible staff, including the wonderful Kiara Davis, who I think is not able to join us tonight, so you must give her our best. But working with them on the Unhoused Bill of Rights, legislation to permanently fund affordable housing for all and stop the criminalization of homelessness. So for all these reasons, we are most honored to present Congresswoman Cori Bush with the 2022 Vento Award. to do the opposite thing. Um, and people are like, yeah, good job. And it's like, okay, but I don't know what else I would do. Um, you know, uh, you know it, it makes me very emotional just thinking about all the people that, um, that are helped. But it's not just helping a person, helping a family. It's helping the, uh, the legacy of that person, the legacy of that family and that community. So thank you to, of course, the National Homeless Law Center for presenting me with this esteemed Bruce F. Vento Award uh, on tonight. I, as a formerly unhoused person, as many of you know uh, my story, my advocacy work for the unhoused community as a member of Congress, it is deeply, deeply personal. And receiving this award today is truly among the highest honors that I have ever received. I'm looking at this picture up here. Um, it's hard to look at. I kept staring at it because it's taking me back to the moments where we literally um, were, you know, sometimes sleeping on those steps, but mostly camped out um, because once they figured out, oh, you're not supposed to, because no one had done this before, so they didn't know we couldn't sleep out there. They didn't know we couldn't have a chair or a sleeping bag. And then once they figured it out, it was like, oh, you can't sleep here, you can't lay down, you can't do all of these things. So we were trying to sleep standing up. and Because um, like there was no book for it, so they were like making it up, I think, because they were wrong. Um, but, you know, from that action on the Capitol steps for four nights, um, in five days to reinstate the federal eviction moratorium to introducing a comprehensive legislative plan that would end the unhoused crisis by 2025. Uh, yes, I remain dedicated to ensuring that every person, every family is guaranteed a roof over their head and safe shelter. But when I think about this photo, um, during that month, you know, that was the moment, that was when we found out that we had won um, the extension. And um, I just remember every moment up until then, from the time we first said we would stay out there, from that moment up until this moment, we didn't know we would win. We didn't know if we would get arrested. We didn't know what would happen. We didn't know how long we would be out there. But what, what I did know 
was that if we didn't do something, that if we didn't put our bodies on the line, because the thing is, we can take temporarily being uncomfortable. We can take being super hot during the day and freezing cold at night, rats running around by our feet, hungry, you know. We can take the noise, uh, uh, the, the constant uh, sound that you hear, you know, and, the, and the, the, the rain falling on us as we were trying to, to sleep and get warm and it just kept raining on us. And nobody talks about what happens when it rains. And you think you got a blanket and then it rains and now your blanket is wet, you're wet and you stay cold. Nobody talks about what it's actually like. And, but the thing is, we knew we could stay out there for a little while if it meant another folk would have to stay out there at all. Yes. Crisis, it, we know it has left millions of people unhoused or housing insecure. In my own state of Missouri, nearly 32,000 students experienced homelessness in, 20, in the 2020-2021 school year. We cannot continue to allow our children to be innocent victims of a system designed to place profits over basic human need. If you think without stable housing, kids struggle to attend school regularly, just as their parents struggle to maintain employment. Without stable housing, members of our community are forced to double up with family, couch surf, sleep in cars like I did, tents under bridges, on the sidewalks, standing up in, indoors, anywhere they can find. I know what it's like to live out of a car with my two babies, to struggle to find a place to bathe or to find food to feed the family, where to mix my baby's formula, or where to use the bathroom, day after day. Without stable housing, we lose the safety, the security, the stability we need to thrive, like food and like water. Having shelter it is a prerequisite to being able to live, making housing undeniably a human right. The legislative solutions. The legislative solutions, they are clear. Policymakers, we have a there are some in this room. I'm, we're honored to have those that are receiving awards on tonight. We have an obligation to provide temporary and permanent housing solutions for all. The federal government is more capable of providing wraparound services to help people access benefits, receive medical care, and provide resources to help people recover from the trauma of living without a home. The emergency provisions that kept people housed during the pandemic don't have to be temporary, nor be a relic of the past. We can enforce a permanent eviction moratorium and we can do it at any time. We can implement indefinite rental assistance programs. Thousands of my constituents in St. Louis were able to stay in their homes during the pandemic because of these people-centered policies. And I know we saved countless lives. We can also address the housing crisis by addressing food insecurity through universal school meals, providing stimulus checks, and child tax credits. We must expand our political imagination and push to reinstate economically just policies, especially those that are broad, broadly, which we know it can happen, bipartisan <laughs> policies, and keep our families housed. We must also continue to push back against the criminalization of our unhoused community members using every tool available, the legal tools, the political tools, or otherwise. Sleeping in public or in a car should not result in jail time or a fine. We have... the way we think about our unhoused neighbors and their needs and how legislators can make real change by fighting to end the unhoused crisis. And I know I'm preaching to the congregation, but I just gotta say it. But thank you, every single one of you, 
And thank you to the National Homeless Law Center for hosting this timely and historic event. Thank you for honoring me, but also congratulations and thank you to every other authoree here tonight. You all are doing the work. You're not just doing the work to help people, you're doing the work to save lives. And when you do the work to save lives, you save families, you save communities, you save this country. So thank you for doing this work that can be thankless and hurtful, but you are the change that we need. And thank you for all the work that you do to support housing justice efforts and advocating on behalf of unhoused individuals in every single place. Thank you. Um, and Dwight for your leadership, especially Dwight as the co-chair um, for this year's event. As a current board member of the National Homelessness Law Center and a previous honoree, I am thrilled to be here presenting our first honoree for the evening. Before I do that, I want to say a bit about the awards presented tonight. The awards contain reproduced artwork created by our friend Murphy Chen. Murphy is an extraordinary artist uh, an activist and a law student at American University's Washington College of Law. In her own words, the works are all related to my experience as a migrant and as someone, somebody who kind of came out of nothing. Thank you so much, Murphy, for sharing your moving and beautiful talents with us. Now, On to our first awardee, or second rather, excuse me. I am delighted to present a Bigger Vision Films with the Student B. McKinney Award for their films, Under the Bridge and Beyond the Bridge. Under the Bridge is an award-winning documentary film about one summer in Indianapolis, say that three times fast, a tent city under a bridge and the criminalization of homelessness in the United States. The film inspired the city of Indianapolis to pass new homeless protection laws and has been screened from coast to coast, including at HUD and Harvard. Beyond the Bridge is their latest film, which focuses on housing as a solution to homelessness and how, even in the face of opposition, housing first models save cities millions of taxpayer dollars. Please enjoy a clip from their upcoming film, Beyond the Bridge.
So we're going to show a film at the end and move right to the awards. Thank you, guys. Don Sawyer and Tim Hashko with the Bigger Vision Films travel the country for this latest documentary, and the Law Center has been honored to be a part of the process. As someone who experienced homelessness myself and is committed to telling my story, I am grateful, so grateful to Don and Tim for taking the time to learn and tell the stories of unhoused neighbors while highlighting the policy decisions that will end homelessness. On behalf of the Law Center, I'm so honored to present Don Sawyer and Tim Hashko of A Bigger Vision of Films with the Stuart B. McKinney Award. cinematographer and editor of the Bigger Vision Films. Uh, and uh, we, we truly, really appreciate this. Uh, you know, we, we, we're making films is what we do. We love the process. We are, it's who we are. Uh, and uh, it is especially rewarding when you make something and it, it leads to a real tangible change. Under uh, the bridge, it was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, led to uh, three pieces of you know new legislation passed in Indianapolis, and that was it was it was it was real. I mean, it's just rewarding for a film filmmaker when that happens. And uh, we hope that with this new film, which spent so much time editing the trailer, <laughs> <laughs> we we put the sound in. <laughs> It's going to be a three-minute little, you know, kind of behind-the-scenes preview of what we've been up to for the last 12 months. Uh, but we, we're, fin we, we're finishing up our production, about to start editing this film, uh, Beyond the Bridge, A Solution to Homelessness, and we really hope that, um, you know, story st storytelling is, is vital to the way humans as species communicate with one another. And uh, we hope that this will be a tool that everybody here in this room can use and, and, and well beyond, you know, beyond, beyond the, the homelessness sector. Uh, what we what we hope to do is to really take the stories of uh, of uh, you know folks with lived expertise who uh, who have been successfully housed and now are thriving and just connect them to 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 the housing as a first um, housing. so many definitions in this one yeah. housing first housing housing as a human right movement we want to connect those stories to that uh, and. We're very honored, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, we hope that our work can make some more difference. So um, this is the first time we've ever been honored. This is a very different feeling and experience. And if it's the last time, it's very gratifying that it's the law center that's done it. Um, I've been uh, associated with them town as he came along later. Been associated with the law center for about nine years now and i've been to conferences we've been to conferences i presented sometimes focus groups i was there when housing not handcuffs started and you know i've been involved with the law center but the one thing i have to say that the law center really did for me which was very cool was um after under the bridge um indianapolis got really upset with us and <laughs> they they were they were putting pressure on me i wasn't even sure Honestly, I don't think we ever said this, but I was even sure I was going to be able to stay there. They were so mad at me. And right about that time, I think it was Eric, maybe someone called and said, hey, um, we're doing something with HUD, and we'd like to show under the bridge and do a panel. Can you come? And I said, yes. And so I slipped out of town very quietly, the way I was going. And 
And we did that event with, with um, Hunt, the Daniel Jane, the law center, and I sat on the panel, and then we did the next day a screening at Landmark Theater here, and then went to Boston to the Landmark Theater. And after all that happened, I um, communicated to Indianapolis, this is what has happened, and they left me alone. <laughs> you know, we now have friends um, nationwide, and they have a very different take on the work that we do. And so I really appreciate the Law Center um, for that. And uh, and it's the, the work of the Law Center is going to be very important. We all know this is real group and all that is coming. And there's going to be lots of, of need to protect the people that we care about while we're all here. So um, that's, that's to the Law Center. Um, I do want to say one thing about um, the, the, the work that we're doing. We're going to have a social impact campaign. It's going to be about 40 cities, you know, and it's going to be all over the country. And they're going to be set up for advocacy. We have to do this work that we all do. We have to do it together. Um, Corey Bush, she needs to see, she needs an army behind her of citizens who care and want this. They demand injustice, you know. We have to bring advocacy to where people see it as one thing, like the other successful civil rights advocacies. And we're, we're trying to, we're going to, this film, Beyond the Bridge, is going to be um, a tool, a great tool that shows that housing services, when needed over criminalization and shelter, is the best way to do it. That's what we're, we're, we're doing. That's what the film's going to show. But it doesn't matter unless we all get together. And we all say the same thing the same way. So I just wanted to say that. And finally, um, um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Samson Gress because he came to support us today. He's been a consultant on the film. A lot of the time, we, he explained to us what we're looking at. It's been very helpful. And, and thank you for the friendship. Thank you, Sam. As a filmmaker, you can't really do a, a lot of things without a lot of support, uh, and we really appreciate all of you uh, supporting us and what you're doing. And I want to, I want to thank too. <laughs> Maybe I'll start crying now. <laughs> uh, uh, two people, two women in my life. Um, one is actually very, uh, very uh, uh, instrumental to why I'm here doing this work. Uh, she, uh, she, she, she's a big uh, homeless, national homeless advocate, former well, 2004 vice presidential candidate, Patricia LaMarche. Uh, she introduced me uh, to two things. One is the homelessness, you know, the, the, the issue of homelessness in the United States. I don't know if you can detect I'm not from the United States originally. Um, so um, she introduced me to that, but also she introduced me to Don. She brought him over to my apartment once. Uh, we were sitting there, so we became attached to the hip since. <laughs> and some might say that that uh, Pat and, and I are also attached to the hip because she has since became my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of course, you know, I, I have to thank, I want to thank my wife, Rebecca. She is the one who brought Pat to me, Pat brought Don in. <laughs> but uh, Rebecca, you know, she, she's the biggest supporter of what Don and I do in the, over the years, and especially this last year. I really appreciate all of you doing, the two of you. Thank you very much. I love you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, you'll hear from us in the future. <laughs> Uh, congratulations, Don and Tim, uh, for your great work, and to all the awardees this evening. Congratulations. It's an honor to be with all of you. Um, I'm Angie Garcia Lathrop. I work at Bank of America during the day, and then great get to do great um, work with organizations like the Law Center in the evening. Um, I'm also the co-chair of tonight's event and a board member. Um, gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce the State Legislator Awardee. This year, it's worth mentioning that all the legislator awards are nonpartisan, 
and the state and local legislator awards were drawn from nominations from over 3,000 member National Housing Not Handcuffs campaign, members of the campaign. Um, so this is a pretty rigorous process, and as a result, we have an incredible award winner tonight. Um, Representative Nicole Macri, tonight's recipient of the State Legislator Award, was nominated by Professor Sarah Rankin, founder and director of the Homeless Rights Advocacy Project at the Seattle University School of Law. Representative Macri was elected to the Washington House of Representatives in 2016 and represents the 43rd Legislative District of Washington. She serves as Vice Chair of the Appropriations Committee and as a member of the Health Care and Wellness Committee. She is also co-chair of the Washington State LGBTQ um, Caucus. Representative McCree has more than 20 years of experience championing issues around affordable housing, homelessness, human services, behavioral health, and health care. She has been at the forefront of the Housing First movement nationally and is a recognized leader in practical and effective strategies that end the homelessness of people living with serious disabilities. In 2021, her Just Cause Eviction Bill became law, ensuring that Washington state landlords provide a valid reason for ending certain leases with tenants, um, a major step in preventing homelessness. Outside the legislature, Nicole is the Deputy Director for the Downtown Emergency Service Center in Seattle, where she has worked since 2002. She has championed Seattle's housing levy to fund affordable housing development and was appointed to the City Council to serve successive terms as a member of the Housing Levy Oversight Committee. So as you can tell, day and night, Nicole is committed to the interests of those that are unhoused and to addressing um, and finding solutions. As you would expect, she also has received numerous other awards um, for her work, and we're very honored tonight to have her with us to present her with the inaugural State Legislator Award. And that um, 
black households, black families were um, seven times more likely to be evicted than white households. This should come as no surprise to us because we know in our state um, over two thirds of black households are renters um, and over half of Latino households are renters, meaning they're just more likely to be evicted because they're living in rental housing. These facts were very compelling when we took them to my colleagues in the legislature, but still we had a lot of trouble passing um, this law because um, the argument that people had the right to earn money off of housing um, was a compelling counter argument to our argument around the human right to have a safe place to live. But we pushed forward. And if there is a silver lining in the um, tragedies of the pandemic, um, one of them, I think, is the ability that, that we had to pass this bill into law. Um, one of the more compelling arguments we were able to bring in 2021 when we brought this bill back for the third or fourth time to the legislature um, was that the work that we were doing to invest not only the dedicated federal funds, but a large proportion of our discretionary state funds into emergency rent assistance was that if we could provide emergency rent assistance to tenants, but landlords could still evict people for any reason or no reason at all, then all of our efforts um, could not be sustained. So that really compelled my colleagues in the legislature to take action in 2021, not only to pass just cause eviction prevention, but in the same year, be one of the first states to pass statewide right to counsel for low-income tenants going through eviction court and to fully fund um, that right to counsel. <laughs> this didn't just happen. It was um, in great part um, thanks to the broad and diverse array of folks working on it. Um, including the many folks you see in this picture, people with lived experience of homelessness and housing instability, people who have been discriminated against because of their gender identity or disability, because of their race or family status, um, and bringing those advocates together with academic research um, and, um, and the compelling um, pressure and the coalition building we did within the legislature um, made it all happen. Um, as you heard, I continue to work in homelessness services um, in Washington state, as in many states, our legislature is a part-time legislature. I think that enriches my work because my work is grounded in the community. Um, so I want to thank all of you for the work that you all do every day across the nation at a national level and in your own communities. I want to thank the Law Center. Um, this award ceremony comes at a good time when we're headed back to the legislature in Washington and in many states in just a few weeks. Um, and I'm going back with resolve to continue to work on housing justice issues, making sure that we create more affordable housing for folks, that we expand the tenant protections. Um, the thing that I have learned is that it is one step at a time. And when we, when we put in one protection, as we did with Just Cause, what we learn is that um, there are ways to get around it. Um, and we are going back to close those ways that folks are getting around it. We are going to be looking at um, how we protect people from predatory rent increases that are um, levied on people specifically to avoid um, uh, abiding by tenant protections. Um, we're going to look at continuing to invest in emergency rental assistance um, and in building 
um, more housing for folks across our state. So thank you, and thank you for the work. I know you all are continuing to do as well. Congratulations, Representative Macri. As a Seattle resident and housing advocate, I could not be more delighted that you received this award. So thanks again for all that you do for people who need housing in Washington State. My name is Katie Meyer Scott, and I'm the Law Center Senior Youth Attorney. I joined the Law Center last year, as of yesterday, as a part of the new team expanding the Law Center's legal work to end youth homelessness. Our team has done extraordinary work this year. We launched a new pro bono program called In-Housing Council, providing legal advice to service providers for unhoused youth. We are exploring potential litigation to prevent the criminalization of unhoused youth due to curfew and truancy laws. We are providing technical assistance to local advocates and state lawmakers pursuing legislation to end youth homelessness. And we continue to work with our partner, True Colors United, to publish the State Index on Youth Homelessness which ranks states based on the laws and policies that affect unhoused youth. It's been an incredible year, and our work has only just begun. Sadly, though, we need to take a moment tonight to honor and recognize that we lost a member of this team due to a tragic accident early last month. Gabriela Gabby Sevilla was the youth attorney at the Law Center and an extremely valuable colleague in this work. She was a unique and remarkable advocate. She openly shared her own experiences with homelessness as she championed laws to protect unhoused youth and repeal laws criminalizing homelessness. Her passion and her realness made an impression on everyone she met. No one forgot her after they met her and no one could meet her without wanting to take action. Join us in honoring Gabby and her work as we share a video compilation of the interviews and testimony she gave as a part of her work with us this past year at the Law Center. at different laws and policies affecting youth experiencing homelessness and try to work at changing them through uh, going to court or you know figuring out um, getting a new law passed or repealed. Another thing about my job and what we do is uh, to define people who are young people experiencing homelessness you know it's from whatever age to 26 you know um, because that's you know, the age that's so critical where people need support. In 2015, my dad left to Ecuador. We were evicted. I was in college. I was in the dorms. She says paying for the education of kids experiencing homelessness or in the foster care system will save us money in the long run. If we give youth experiencing homelessness this little bit of uh, support to you know, go to college and get that education, yes, it can quite literally save money on shelters, on services, on public benefit programming. We are in strong support of House Bill 304, which will limit the use of failure to obey a reasonable and lawful order to specific instances like emergencies. We support um, House Bill 304 because we need to enact change to prevent the further criminalization of people experiencing homelessness in Maryland. Okay, 86.6% of cases had all charges dropped for the failure to obey a lawful order was hard. Um, we also had, from Baltimore City District Court, had heard at least 13,437 cases that had at least one charge of failure to obey a lawful order. Out of all of these, over 85% of the total number of the cases that dropped entirely um, suggested an instant um, existence of over-policing. We want to um, ignite and create those connections with state advocates, local advocates, 
And this word of advocate, you know, it doesn't mean a professional, it's a person, it's someone who cares, it's a human being, and we want you to connect with you all and also, you know, remove this, like, yes, and I'm an attorney, but I'm a person with lived experience, and you've heard everyone else's story, so I can't speak for them, but that's who I am. and people are, are people, I guess, you know, like, if you do have, like, an extra water bottle to give someone, if you do have an extra dollar to give someone, if you do have a chance to tell someone else, like, hey, you know, be, you treat people nicer, they're still humans, you don't know their story or, or where they're from or how they got there, I think it's, is what you all can do to help, you know, build that compassion, because that's the problem. A lot of people just don't care about that. I'm most proud of. Um, just being at, at my job at my age, I guess I'm, I'm only 28. Um, I'm really uh, blessed to be here. I guess I didn't have uh, an easy path to get to, to my job. Um, yeah, like I, you know, I graduated college and I, I didn't have a, a place to call home after and I, I figured it out. So I guess I'm just, I'm just really proud of myself, <laughs> I guess, for, for just making it. Um, and that's enough sometimes, you know, like, <laughs> I don't need a single thing. working to end homelessness in the U.S. One of those is the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless, where Gabby interned during her third year of law school at Howard University School of Law. The Legal Clinic is the kind of organization where you can spread your wings as a young advocate, champion the needs of the community as the community directs you, and be a part of a strong community pursuing justice. The legal clinic has always been this way, in large part because of the nurturing leadership of its longtime executive director, Patricia Malahi Fugere, known to everyone as Patty. Patty, who co-founded the legal clinic initially as a board member before becoming its second executive director, has made it her life's work advocating for the legal rights of unhoused neighbors. And that commitment to uplifting their voices has left a deep and lasting legacy of justice in the District of Columbia. The Legal Clinic is truly a powerful housing justice organization. And it is held forth as a model by similar programs across the country. 
for addressing both the emergency legal needs of unhoused neighbors while pursuing systemic solutions to homelessness from legislation to major litigation. Patty has shared the infrastructure of the legal clinic to support the launch of many related justice initiatives, such as the DC Fair Budget Coalition, the Community Listening Project, and the Affordable Housing Initiative. Her ability to listen to the needs of the community and create the space for others to do so is a model for us all. Now, Patty has mentored in her over 30 years at the legal clinic, generations of social justice champions who themselves have dedicated their lives to this work. I should know, I'm one of them. A Patty protege. <laughs> to be one, and I'm not alone in this room in that role. Patty, you are somewhere that I don't see yet. There she is. <laughs> Your mentees, as you know, have continued to champion justice in so many fora, at fellow legal services organizations working at the local, state, and federal levels to teaching justice at law schools, as you have as well, to even influencing policy at the White House. All of us carry with us a common gift, the lessons Patty has taught us that influence our policy advocacy and the way we pursue our work. How can we create the spaces for the voices of persons most affected to be heard? That was a common question that Patty always asked us as we learned how to champion justice. How can we create the spaces? Now, Patty has a long history with the Law Center, having served on a temporary basis as executive director in the early years of the Law Center. And so I join with the entire Law Center family, many of you in this room, but particularly my colleagues at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless in presenting this inaugural Justice Award to the woman who has taught us so much. Patty, thank you for your leadership. associated with an award that's called the Justice Award. It's especially meaningful um, that Antonia started her remarks making a connection between Gabby and the Legal Clinic. I didn't get the opportunity to know her well, but I, I knew her as light and energy embodied. She walked in to the office and you knew she was there because she was just so overflowing with her, her passion and her commitment. And she's a light that was darkened way too soon. Um, so thank you for giving the time for folks to learn about her and how important she was. So uh, what Antonia didn't say in talking about me is that um, I actually don't work at the legal clinic <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Uh, so I do have a little bit 
more time on my hands. And one of the things that I've been doing in my time is thinking a lot about what justice is. What does it really mean? In some circles, conversations might have one believing that having more lawyers means getting more justice. I'm not really sure I agree. It helps. Think about it, though. Will we really have secured justice if we ensure that every defendant in LMT court has a lawyer when that victory merely allows the tenant to stay in a place they'll never be able to afford in a neighborhood with inadequate transportation, no grocery store, environmental hazards, and poorly performing schools. Is that justice? Will we have secured justice when we've gotten a client released from prison, when they'll return to a community that failed to educate them, always isolated them, occasionally abused them, and now would prefer to neither house nor employ them? Is that justice? It feels like lowering up all of the legal problems that our clients endure doesn't necessarily get us to justice. So, so what then does it really mean? As usual, when I turn to our clients for an answer, I find wisdom. Uh, I was thinking about a video that the legal clinic prepared um, 10 years ago uh, called A Journey Home, and it followed several clients on their journeys home. And we asked those clients what justice meant to them. Well, one of the clients said, remember, there are a lot more people out there who need what I have. And what she had was just recently receiving a key to her own apartment, a place to call home. Remember, there are a lot of people who need that. Justice, another client shared, means we have to think about everyone who's impacted by housing security, not just us. Access to justice is a start. Uh, we need more lawyers to tip the balance of power in LMT court, right? We need to bring people back home from prison. We need to do so much more to make the systems accessible to people um, who are, are, are otherwise unrepresented and not able to take advantage of our legal systems. But that can't be the only thing that we are called to achieve. That's not the whole of it. True justice means we have to get uncomfortable, right? Instead of giving of our surplus, as charity invites us to do, justice means we have to give of our substance so that everyone can have enough. And this in turn demands that we change systems and law and change hearts. Systems and laws can be reformed, but we all know that administrations come and go Reforms can be affected and then they're lost. Laws can be amended. But hearts have to change, right? Hearts, until they are changed, and until they embrace the truth that justice isn't about just us, until hearts understand there are a lot more people out there who need a place to call home, until hearts grasp that simply by the virtue of our humanity, everyone should have a right to, to that home, until hearts are in that place, true housing justice remains elusive. For most of my 31 years as a clinic's director, I thought I'd be there forever. I imagined that I would walk out the door that final time when the work was done. I said we would go home when everyone had a home to which they could go. I thought I would be able to quote with integrity one of my favorite scripture passages. Uh, St. Paul, reflecting on his life, once said, I, com I competed well, I finished the race, I kept the faith. I thought that would be me, finishing the race. But about a year ago, I started to think about leaving the clinic so I could spend more time with my beloved family. Beloved family. <laughs> But then I thought, how can I do this? How can I step aside when we're so far from the finish line? How can I be a quitter? But then I got some humility. If anybody knows the legal clinic and has known us long, you would know uh, our dear, long now departed colleague, Mary Ann Luby. I think she kind of just smacked me upside the head <laughs> and said, Patty, it's not about you. You know, you are one in a, in a in a group 
group of a whole lot of us who, who have a responsibility for this. You are not the only runner in the race. The race is a relay, a very, very, very long relay, but it's a relay. And um, it was time for me to pass the baton, just as it had been passed on to me. It was time for me to pass it on. And it's given me comfort to know that there's so many amazing people who are there taking the baton and moving this forward. My wonderful colleagues at the legal clinic, here, legal clinic, I love you, our board and our staff, and now under the wonderful directorship of our newly named executive director, Amber Harding. And our amazing alumni, like Antonia, is amazing. And uh, one, of, one of our other alums who I, I'm going to tell you, keep an ear out for the name Will Merrifield. Yeah. Right? He left us to um, promote the cause of social housing, which gets at that profit motive that Representative was talking about in, in um, social housing is, uh, has a lot of wisdom, so stay tuned for more work on that front. I know that each of you here is a champion for housing justice. Some of you are well positioned to change systems and laws, and some of you are well positioned to change hearts. Whether you're an advocate, a pro bono attorney, a government official, or a community member with that compassionate heart, hold on tightly to your baton. While it's your leg of the race, compete well and keep the faith. And in turn, while my name is the one associated with this award tonight, I, I hope you'll afford me the grace to think of it as a team award, not only for the legal clinic, but for all of us here who have committed ourselves and who have committed our hearts to the cause of House and Justice. Thank you so much. States across the country, there has been template legislation that we talked about um, from the Cicero Institute all day today that you've heard about. And that, that's, that legislation that has been proposed to be advanced would increase criminalization of the homeless, uh, of homelessness, excuse me, defund affordable housing, and expand mental health commitment laws to involuntarily institutionalized, unhoused people who refuse shelter or other services. Wow. Now, a lot of times in these circles, we hear things like this, and it kind of, we, we, we just get used to it, right? We get used to hearing startling facts, get used to hearing startling statistics, but I'm going to say that again so that we drive on the point that this was going to be a law. Increase criminalization of homelessness, defund affordable housing, and expand mental health commitment Laws to invo in involuntarily institu institutionalize unhoused people who refuse shelter or other services. And that bill was the Georgia Reducing Street Homelessness Act of 2022. So what could we do as a law center? One of the great gifts that we have is a wonderful network of pro bono uh, law firms and pro bono attorneys that work with us all across the country. Um, and so as we thought about what to do, we uh, tried to describe this problem, and all we had to do is put that problem down in an email, click the mouse, and we sent the email to Mary Benton uh, and the people at the Austin and Bird law firm. 
Uh, and they quickly assembled a team uh, that conducted quick and detailed research that provided a legal base, basis to successfully oppose these, these laws across the country. And that research is, is going to be used to not just strike down, again, not just strike down the Georgia law, but law all the way across the country. But not only that, <laughs> not, not only that, but they went the extra mile towards you know, helping us to rethink our, our pro bono efforts overall through our Homelessness Action Legal Team. Because as you see, click the mouse, they took action, right? Uh, Cheryl Naja, also the, the pro bono and community service director of the firm, is co-chairing Halt, our Homelessness Action Legal Team. And you can see our wonderful um, Halt sponsors who are, are listed here, all of them on, uh, on this board. And we want to thank you who are all present tonight uh, for your continued uh, support of the law so, so, you know, especially this, I'm especially, we're especially delighted tonight that we have Mary and Cheryl here to accept this award. Um, Austin has pretty much anything that we've, we've, we've asked and, and said that we needed, if they had the power to uh, help us, they stepped up to the plate in so many different ways beyond what can be put on this paper. So I want to call Cheryl and, and uh, Mary up to receive your award. and to have the opportunity to partner with the Law Center on this incredibly impactful work across the country. Um, it's incredibly humbling as well to be in the same um, group as all the other awardees, so congratulations to everyone here. Um, the work that you've heard about and that we're involved with on a pro bono basis, and we're lawyers, and so that's what we do, um, is led by an incredibly talented and passionate team of attorneys. And I'm getting all emotional. The work that y'all do, for, raise your hands for the staff in this room. We haven't honored y'all tonight. <laughs> Um, Y'all are the ones out there on the front lines doing this, and, and we're just, um, you know, grateful to be able to help you all in preventing homelessness and advocating for those who are unhoused. Um, we're all here tonight because we believe in the human right to housing, and so Alston and Bird also believes in that, our attorneys believe in that, and so we are privileged to, um, to be able to do this pro bono support. As we have heard tonight, the forum today, criminalizing how, um, how criminalizing those who are experiencing homelessness and putting up obstacles in their way to secure housing, to seek medical treatment, to obtain jobs, doesn't just not solve that problem. It exacerbates the problem. It causes more problems. And usually this resort and this effort by jurisdictions and governments is led by fear, by expediency, by self-interest, as we heard today. And so, also misinformation. And so the role that the Law Center provides in um, providing the expert data and the research, you can see all of their publications on the websites. The testimony that Eric is giving out um, across the country against these awful laws like the Cicero Institute laws. Um, litigating to hold jurisdictions accountable so that they do not provide this harm to the communities. Um, and so much of the other legal work that the center does is just incredibly vital. And the center cannot do this on their own, and so that's why we're so incredibly proud to be a part of this. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl now because HALT is ready and willing and able to, to take more members. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you for an award. Can I say thank you to all of you who have been standing through this incredibly <laughs> powerful. So you you get a round of applause. Thank you. Um, thank you for being, because I first want to start by saying thank you.
thank you to Carlton. Um, he is just amazing. And uh, my co-chair, Matt, Matt Ferguson, we work on HALT matters all the time um, and really trying to strengthen this group. Over and over tonight, I have heard that theme, together we can do this. And really, that is what HALT is about. Um, it's not an acronym. It really is meant to be this call to action for companies, their in-house groups, their and law firms across the country. You know, you can work on an issue here and work on an issue there, but through the center and through HALT, we can work across the country together. And I think that is what's so powerful and be a core supporter of the work that they are leading nationally. So it's been really powerful to me to be a part of this. And I have to say, yes, we're honored for this award, but I'm almost embarrassed that the whole staff is not up here with us because everything that we do, we are doing with you. So thank you. Thank you to the board members. This is just so incredible. Thank you from somebody down in Georgia. Y'all, we are grateful. That's all. <laughs> solutions to homelessness. He has seen the opening or approval of hundreds of new units of supportive housing and new bridge housing, has purchased motels for use as affordable housing, and is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's more, there's more. He's opened sites for safe parking and safe camping, and he's championed with his colleagues one of the largest and most comprehensive rent relief programs in the country, saving tenants and small landlords from financial ruin. He has fought for some of the toughest tenant protection rules in the nation and for the right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. You may have read about this on Twitter. We cannot underscore enough the opposition that Council Member Bonin has faced. He was nominated by Housing Not Handcuffs member Martha Bridegroom and selected amongst a group of nominees by the Law Center's team for his leadership to decriminalize homelessness and promote housing solutions. Councilman. On it. Thank you for your bravery and for your leadership. And we hope you know there is a community here and outside of this room that is grateful for the positions that you have taken, the bravery you've shown, and the way that you protect the lives of unhoused people. And for these reasons, we are honored to award you the inaugural Local Legislator Award. <laughs> incredible honor. This is really humbling uh, and, and, and deeply, deeply grateful. It came, the news of this award came at a time that was particularly challenging for me and my family and uh, it means a lot. Uh, I want to give a shout out to a few people. I want to acknowledge uh, such a mentor of my staff who does all the real work. <laughs> Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Shayla Myers from the Great Foundation of Los Angeles for all the fighting this fight. I want to acknowledge Mark Horvath of Invisible People 
for telling the stories that make change. And I want to acknowledge Sam Samaras. I don't think we've ever met in person. On Zoom, though. On Zoom, yes. Uh, but his work has really been the foundation for the work of so many others. Thank you, Sam. That's a pretty good contingent from L.A., right? Four of us? Five of us. So I, I really appreciate this acknowledgement because the past several years, uh, from Twitter and in person, including on the front steps of my home, have been uh, a, a real fight. Uh, a fight against really well-resourced opponents of housing and shelter. A fight to insist on the right to housing, and a fight against the very loud voices that say that housing is not a right and claim that it is something that needs to be earned. It's been a lot of fights against criminalization and a fight against a horrible, ugly narrative that dehumanizes people. And frankly, it's been way too many fights against other elected officials and against an establishment that makes way too many excuses to do way too little. Uh, I need to acknowledge, though, that I have not always been a, a leader in this fight. When I got elected nine and a half years ago, I did not want to make homelessness the issue that I spent all my time on. Like any elected official, I want to be popular. And working on homelessness is not a bad way to be popular. And when I came in, I even bowed to the political pressure, and I voted for some things that criminalized homelessness. And I gotta tell you, I'll tell you from experience, they did not work. They failed. They made homelessness work. They made homelessness worse. And they were wrong then, and they're even more wrong now. And I was really called after my first few years into this fight by by relentless, relentless and not always polite, but relentless advocates who demanded something better in Los Angeles. I was called into this because four or five people were dying every damn day on the streets of Los Angeles, and it was a crisis you could not ignore. And I was called into this because I had a little boy, and there was no way to look him in the eye and come up with any justifiable excuse for what was happening on the streets of Los Angeles. And there was no way I could tell him that I've done everything I can. I knew that I had to dig down deeper and I knew I had to do more. And you know, I was called into this really by my own story as well. Uh, when I first moved to LA in the 1990s, I struggled with alcohol and, and with addiction. And um, in my mid 20s, I wound up living some time on the street. I slept in my car quite a few nights. I slept on the beach. I bounced around. And that was a long time ago, and it was for a relatively short time. And it is in no way, not even close, to comparable to what people are enduring and dying from in encampments on the streets of Los Angeles. I remember how scary it is. I remember how disorienting and frustrating and angering and confusing it is for the sun to be setting and to not know where you're going to sleep. I remember how lost and alone you feel. I remember make myself remember every single day how easy it is to fall down. And I remember how hard it is to get back up. And I remember what it is that helped me get back up. Others reached out to me. They extended a hand. They lifted me up. And they helped me heal. And for me, I think that's what we are all called to do, to lift one another up. Not to save someone, but to help them. We need to see them. We need to hear them. We need to hug them. 
when we lift each other up, we increase and magnify the dignity of both of us. And when we hug each other, we expand and we magnify exponentially the humanity of both of us. But what's really different today is how hard it is to get back up. The, the terrain is so slippery and the path is so narrow and so congested and there are so many more people trying to desperately grab on to that ladder and find that path out. And today, because of all of the pushes to criminalize homelessness, again and again and again, because as I said earlier today, it's the thing that we have discussed most in my nine years on the city council. Not how to house people, how to criminalize them. And because of those discussions, as people are trying to get up, society's kicking them. It's throwing punches at them. It's throwing rocks at people and it's pushing them back down. It's NIMBYs, it's cops, it's the media, it's politicians and it's elected officials insisting that you're not human enough, we're not worthy enough to get up. And that's just wrong. I'd like to remember, and I think we need to remember that we are all all of us, fragile, fragile. We all break, we all stumble, we all fall down. We are all broken, broken angels, but broken. And we all have to lift each other up so we can fly together. We have to do it. We can. It's gonna take more money, it's gonna take more lawsuits, it's going to take better narrative. It's going to take more advocacy. It's going to take more housing. It's going to take more hugs. It is a lot of work, a lot of work. And it's particularly daunting in a country with a society and an economy and a criminal justice system and a healthcare system and a housing system and an economic system that manufactures homelessness. But I have faith that we can do it. I have faith because of all the people in this room. I have faith because of the incredible people who are taking, literally taking to the streets in Los Angeles and insisting that we do things better and we do things more humanely. I have faith because just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, voters in Los Angeles voted to tax mansions when they get sold so that we can fund housing, so that we can fund purchase of hotels, so that we can fund the right to housing, so that we can fund rent relief, and so that we can start to fund social housing in Los Angeles. And I am really, really encouraged by the mutual aid groups that are popping up in Los Angeles. I am so encouraged to see moms with their young children, toddlers, going out into the parks of Los Angeles and getting down on their knees and meeting with people living in tents, asking them what they need, asking how they can help, building day by day, night by night, Cliff bar by cliff bar, bottle of water by bottle of water, building trust and building a relationship, sticking a hand out and helping lift someone up. I see that every day. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're gonna have to dig a lot, we're gonna have to scratch a lot, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we can do it. Um, I'm leaving office in 25 days. Uh, so I really particularly appreciate the timing of this acknowledgement. Uh, I just want to say that as I leave office, I, I, I cannot and I don't want to leave this battle. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next, but I, I, I am absolutely committed to continuing to work to get people indoors and to end this crisis of homelessness. This work is necessary and it's more important than ever, and I look forward to finding new ways to engage with you to fight this fight. Thank you.
powerful and your work is inspiring. And now I hope uh, we can take a second shot at seeing the inspirational video from Don and Tim, hopefully with the sound this time. <laughs> journey to discover the solutions to homelessness. So your answer is to put these people in temporary spaces, right? That's not a solution. Society thinks shelters are a solution, but the shelters don't think they're the solution. And the people who stay in them actually think that they're the problem. We're just pouring money into the emergency response, $50,000 per person, and they've got nothing. <laughs> Not only is the most effective solution to homelessness, it is the most cost-effective solution to homelessness. Housing First, the model is housing and services. No, it's not. I promise you it is. No, it's not. The support services are what make the model successful. I wouldn't be alive if we were Housing First. What is the dysfunction? It's just a lack of partnerships, a lack of collaboration. Everybody can point the finger at one another and nobody takes full responsibility. You have to have everybody buy in. You can't just look at people who are on the streets right now. You also have to stop the inflow. It costs about half to build a building like this. It's no mistake that almost everybody in our system is black experiencing homelessness. This is actually the systems that founded this country working exactly as they were intended to, to prioritize wealth and safety and resources for white people while deprioritizing those things for people of color. Racism ultimately causes homelessness. There are homeless advocates who are challenging the system. Housing is a human right. There are progressive policy makers challenging the system. I remember what it was like to be cold in that car and to wonder if my kids we're going to die in the middle of the night. And then there's a status quo that says, I ain't trying to see this shit go away. You get the public on board, we're gonna solve it. The problem is powerful. tonight to hear the words of the public servants, lawyers, filmmakers who spoke this evening and shared some of the ways we can help to address homelessness in this country. And once again, let us congratulate all of the 2022 Human Right to Housing Award honorees. <laughs> still text to give by addressing a text to the number 44321 and entering HRTH22 in the message block. You'll then receive a text back with a secure link that you can use to make a donation to help the organization meet its fundraising goal for this event. Before we end, I would like to thank the event host committee, the presenters, and this evening's sponsors, including our leaders of justice, Kaiser Permanente, and the National Association of Realtors. And most importantly, I want to thank all the members of the staff of the Law Center for doing such a great job putting on this wonderful event, and especially for all of their skill and dedication in working every day 
toward ending and preventing homelessness. Thank you.